Uh, well, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Um, uh, I'm sure uh, that you, like me, are filled with admiration uh, for our hosts here at the Oslo Freedom Foundation. Um, they're altruistic, they're engaged, they're principled. The event they've organized here uh, speaks to their determination to use the freedoms of Europe to create a space where um, victims of oppression, the opponents of autocratic regimes, can come and talk freely, talk without restraint. Um, events like this cast a kind of spell. There are so many good and brave people, they are speaking their minds. And I hate to be the one uh, that has to be, uh, break the spell or be the bearer of bad tidings, but I have to tell uh, people from the Middle East, from Africa, from South America, from Asia, not everyone in Europe is like for, and, uh, and, and his wonderful team here. Um, the Oslo Freedom Foundation is an exceptional organization in Europe. Alas, it is not a typical one. Which doesn't mean that we don't have extraordinary freedoms, both historically by uh, European standards and still, unfortunately, extraordinary by global standards. But there are tensions, there are problems, there are uh, new forms, new pressures and new constraints coming up. And uh, 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 you could write a book on them. In fact, I have. Uh, and I could, go on, uh, I could go on all day about them. And in fact, I've only got 10 minutes. So I thought in the spirit of Western self-criticism, I would just pick out two um, uh, points uh, which show problems with the European, I would say, the, right, the wider, uh, by Europe and North American, developed world right, and one with the develop, developed world left, which may uh, concern people in this room. On the Western right, there has always been pressure to put trade and national interests before human rights. Uh, Western conservatives typically argue we look after our own people, we look after our own businesses, other countries, other peoples, they are not our concern. Let me warn you that that pressure is about to become a lot more severe. We are living through uh, a crisis in Western economies as far-reaching and dangerous uh, as any crisis we've had since the 1930s. And the uh, historians among you might remember that the 1930s, that dismal decade, was not a, a great time for liberty, equality and fraternity, to put it mildly. Uh, the British and American banking system is bust. Both countries are burdened with fantastic levels of public and private debt. The Eurozone, meanwhile, is in a uh, rolling economic crisis, which Eurozone leaders, to my astonishment, seem to lack the ability or the will to solve. In these circumstances, those of you who want Western governments to stop selling arms or surveillance equipment to dictatorial regimes are going to have a hard time of it. Those of you who protest, I was talking to uh, uh, some Americans this morning, those of you who protest about it, perhaps using uh, uh, passive resistance, direct action to draw attention to it, I think we are going to see governments being a lot more unforgiving in the punishments they hand out as, a, as, as, as the uh, crisis rolls on. We have a speakers' conference, I heard speakers at this conference quite rightly, quite justifiably, denouncing Western collaboration with regimes in Bahrain and Saudi Arabia. You can expect your protests to meet with an even frostier response than usual in the future. Uh, the economic decline of the West has, has, has some malign consequences. Uh, I shudder when I imagine the guffaws from, say, the Chinese Communist Party leadership when uh, politicians like Hillary Clinton give lectures on how societies must open up to the Internet. Otherwise, they will suffer economically. I can just imagine, I don't know, the Saudi royal family or the Chinese communist leadership saying, really? We'll suffer economically, will we? Are you sure? Um, America has freedom of speech written into its constitution. Uh, and European countries, which allow uh, considerable levels of freedom of speech, have seen a collapse in economic power while China has boomed. Very ominous, ladies and gentlemen, uh, when, in the short term at least, dictatorships appear to be good for business when a repression appears to work, when repression appears to make money, uh, when liberals such as you, you're saying, well, you know, liberal society has failed, autocratic regimes, not totalitarian, but autocratic regimes, they seem to be doing quite well at the moment. Now, I'm not one of those journalists who uh, likes to attack leaders of my country or leaders of Norway uh, and despise them as politicians just because they're politicians. 
uh, democracy needs politicians. Uh, you cannot have one uh, without politicians. They are regrettable necessities, like a, a bowel movement, perhaps. Um, uh, you may not like them, but you would miss it if it wasn't there. Um, uh, and I, I'm just simply, simply pointing out something that strikes me as a fact of life. It is always hard to get politicians to make a stand on human rights, and it's going to get harder. Now, that might matter less from a European perspective, um, because it's not only governments that rule the world. Uh, ideas move the minds and the hearts of, of men and women. They sweep across the world, and politicians place to keep up with them, as, as Mona was saying, about with Harville's line, about words being worth more, more, worth more than ten divisions. If the citizens of the West, the still rich and privileged citizens of the West, show solidarity, that greatest of left-wing virtues, propagate um, uh, emancipatory ideas, then we can still help others. Yet now I must turn to the problem with the left side of your European politics, to uh, my tribe, my people, uh, the European left, and point out a second problem. That solidarity is in very short supply. We are good at opposing injustice caused by Western governments and their allies. We're pretty good at opposing white racism in our own societies. We are, are as a rule, absolutely hopeless at opposing anti-Western regimes and, mov uh, and movements and showing the necessary solidarity with their victims. Just to return to the subject of my book, if you're looking at censorship in Europe over the past generation, the greatest cause, particularly on the left, of censorship and self-censorship uh, has been fear of militant religion. Uh, from the attempts to murder Salman Rushdie, through uh, the actual murder of Theo van Gogh, the hounding of Iron Hersey Alley, the Danish cartoon crisis, it was absurdly called, imagine having a crisis about cartoons. Uh, there has been a, a deep fear has arisen about subjecting militant Islam uh, uh, and its founding myths to scrutiny. Now, I'm not saying that uh, uh, militant Islam is the only reactionary movement in Europe. How can I say that? in a city that has suffered the uh, psychopathic attentions of Anders Breivik. But militant religion, however, is the only paramilitary force in Europe that targets writers uh, and thinkers. This would be bad enough if there were not a further trouble that this militant religion has emerged as a threat in Europe of a time of great phoniness, great, great phoniness in Western intellectual culture, uh, writers, artists, academics, actors, journalists such as myself, living very comfortable lives. Uh, we talk as if we're members of a revolutionary underground, if we are the moral equivalents of uh, dissenters in authoritarian or, or, or dictatorial regimes who really are risking their lives. We use phrases like we speak truth to power, we transgress boundaries, we smash taboos, we challenge establishments. And we do indeed do all of those things when it's safe. Uh, we criticise our own politicians without restraint because we know that whatever we say, the secret police won't come round to our homes and harm us. However, when confronted by men who will harm us or may harm us, uh, we fall into a type of silence. Uh, what is worse, we can't admit our fear because that would destroy our image as courageous speakers of truth to power, the transgressors of boundaries, and all the rest of it. Um, if we admitted it, we would, uh, we would look ridiculous in other people's eyes and in our own eyes. So we surround uh, taboo subjects with a, a bodyguard of uh, politi politically correct humbug. Uh, we pretend that it's somehow uh, racist or imperialist to challenge uh, di divinely ordained reaction. This fear, this self-censorship, has had a profound effect on European liberalism, and I would say on the human rights movement globally, and one that you ought to be aware of. The most awful consequences have been felt by immigrants to Europe and their children. We are now in the absurd position when women, where women from ethnic minorities, fighting against misogyny and bigotry, cannot count on the support of white European, Europeans who call themselves feminists or liberals or socialists. They have so tied themselves in, knot, in knots, they cannot oppose, in plain, clear language, men who want to subjugate the women, kill the homosexuals, kill the Jews, 
kill any adult who of his or her own free will decides to change their religion or decides that there is no God and it's time to grow up. Unless Western liberals change and change fast, we will not be able to help liberals in the Arab world with the support and, above all, the arguments that they need and have every right to expect from us when, they, when and if they are confronted by the new movement <coughs> of the religious right, which I fear they are going to be. Uh, Mona said something on the BBC a few years ago, which I uh, copied down and slapped right in my book. Uh, I doubt she'll remember it. She was arguing with a rather uh, sly and slippery uh, religious conservative by the name of Tariq Ramadan, and she came up with a basic truth about the evasions of Western liberalism. She said, look, multiculturalism has failed in Europe. It's failed because there has been no fight back against the Islamist right wing. I would go further than that and say many of my fellow uh, liberal Europeans won't even admit that Islamist right wing exists. Now, uh, Ibsen used to walk these streets. Uh, the hotel where we've been so uh, graciously put up, the Grand Hotel, he used to stop there for uh, coffee in the morning. Uh, anyone who has seen and, and read his plays will know that the struggle for the emancipation of women beginning in the late 19th century, early 20th century, was one of his central themes, the struggle for emancipation from Judeo-Christian prejudices of old Europe. <clears throat> um, as Ibsen shows, I mean, boy, does he show, that struggle is always messy, it's hard, the consequences are unpredictable, of course they are. But Ibsen at least knew one thing, and I quote, a woman cannot be herself in the society of the present day, which is an exclusively masculine society, with laws framed by men and with a judicial system that judges feminine conduct from a masculine point of view. Now, the left of Ibsen's day applauded his challenge to traditional culture. Too many on the left of our day, not everyone, but too many on the left of our day, now venerates traditional culture as if cultures were self-contained units, as if they never changed, as if those born into them had no choice but to accept them uh, and never challenge them, and no need to challenge them either. One I haven't talked about, terribly important, when we say we talk about the free world and the unfree world, most of us know what limitations are on freedom of speech when we go to work. We can condemn our politicians, but we cannot speak publicly about our employers, even when, in, in the case of the banks, our employers are leading institutions and countries to ruin. We don't speak out because of fear for sack. Uh, there's a lot to be said, and I think uh, other speakers will say it, on how far the net and Twitter and all of that is an emancipatory technology and how far it might, it might aid, um, uh, it might aid uh, uh, oppression. Uh, uh, as I say, I haven't got time for all of that. I, I will leave you, though, uh, with... Uh, one thing I have learned, um, both in my career as a journalist, which has gone on far longer now than I, than I like to remember, and, uh, and in researching this book, whether you live in a democracy or dictatorship, whether you're confronting economic power or the power of employers or corporate power or religious power or political power, censorship is at its most effective when no one admits it exists. Let me repeat that. Censorship is at its most effective when no one admits it exists. When the powerful can say to outsiders, well, look, you're complaining. No one else here is complaining. You know, no one else. Have you been censored? No, of course they haven't been censored. They're happily going along with the status quo. Um, I'm English and I don't like, uh, I've got a sort of natural aversion to uh, great slogans and <clears throat> great radical calls for action. I like small practical steps. Uh, the first pr small practical step that people can take, uh, and it is very small, is there will be times when you're engaged in any fight when you need to find the courage to admit that you're afraid. You need to find the courage that many European liberals lack at the moment to admit that you are afraid. It may not sound much, but once you do that, you, first, you lay open the possibility there are important subjects you want to talk about, you need to talk about, but you fear the consequences. You... Um, Call oppression by its proper name. You call censorship by the prop its proper name. You at least admit it exists. And, of course, to go back to that old <clears throat> virtue of solidarity, the more people who are prepared to admit they are afraid, the less reason there is to fear. Thank you very much.